Is TikTok destroying sports? That's interesting. When was the last time you watched a full game of football without checking your phone? Wait, you're on your phone right now, aren't you? Come on, pay attention. Live broadcasting via television has been one of the most important income streams of sports. With millions of people glued to their screens watching football, tennis or athletics, TV companies raked in billions from advertising and subscription fees. This money trickled... I'm kind of working on a Marketing Monday about this. I'm going to watch this, but I, I, I am working on a Marketing Monday about this. ...down to the clubs and athletes. But there is a major threat to this ecosystem. Every year, fewer young people watch live sports. Phones and social media are stealing their attention away at an alarming rate. If television and money games. dries up, what will happen to the sports we know and love? Welcome to Athletic Interest. In this video, we will explain how the way we watch Just sports is changing, intro. why the rise of TikTok threatens live sports, and how the answer might lie in the history of Spotify and Netflix. I'm actually very interested in this. They might talk about this, but I want to say... Um... You know, one thing that I'll kind of naturally self-correct is as the cable companies lose their fucking iron grip on the right to all this stuff and Amazon and Hulu and more places started buying it, you'll be able to watch this stuff more easily on your phone, ideally like with chat and, and, and more social experiences. And that's going to make it a lot more... Right, right now there's a problem where like it's locked into these paywalled cable... People are watching less cable because the business model sucks, but they would watch more sports if it was easy and digital and online and available. So, Old versus young, baby boomers versus millennials, Gen Z versus everyone else. This civil war is essentially based on the older generation thinking their younger counterparts are lazy and entitled, while the younger generations see the baby boomers as selfish and out of touch. And now Gen Z, alongside their millennial are allies, are launching an attack on one of the most sacred aspects of boomer culture, life sports. It is a slight exaggeration to classify life sport as something exclusively enjoyed by the older generations. But the statistics do paint an interesting picture. Around half of young US sports fans prefer highlights over live games. Most fans over 50 like the traditional life experience better. Even the world's most popular sport football is noticing this generational divide. Most young fans prefer to watch clips of goals on social media over longer broadcasts. Yeah. For them, live TV is a thing of the past. In the words of Juventus chairman Andrea Agnelli, I have the privilege of having five kids, but I don't think one of them has ever sat next to me for 90 minutes when I was watching the game. In reality, <laughs> no sport is safe. Almost half of people aged 13 to 23 have no interest in any sport whatsoever. Even if you manage to find a young sports fan, statistically, they will have a greater interest in esports than the traditional game. Ooh, that makes me so happy. <laughs> Just as someone who <laughs> believed this, you know, when I was fucking uh, that young. <laughs> and at that time, nobody else did. And uh, now it's fucking commonplace. But I, I just really, 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 I've always been, you know, I think I'm less now actually than I ever was. But I used to be a real fiery, passionate esports guy. Like esports is going to take over. Esports is big. Believe in esports. So how worried should we be about the decline in interest of live games? Well, if you like football, you might find this next part a bit disturbing. In the 90s, technology for broadcasting live football started to improve and the industry took off. Almost overnight, billions were pumped into football clubs. These clubs have since invested in players, stadiums, training grounds, scouting and marketing campaigns. They accumulated billions in debt under the assumption that broadcasting revenue would cover the costs. Most top clubs get around 40% of their revenue from television. For many, the share is even more significant. For example, Roma or Everton. But all good things must come to an end. Most experts agree that broadcasting revenues peaked in 2018. 
Even potential growth markets, such as China, are starting to crumble. In 2020, the Premier League terminated a lucrative half a billion pound contract with a Chinese streaming service when the company failed to make payments. French football oh, narrowly escaped collapse in 2020 after the breakdown of their TV rights deal with MediaPro. Despite this scare, the league entered a new deal with Amazon for significantly less money. Yeah, if sports comes. like football have any hope of engaging new fans, they yeah. need to understand. The tech companies are now swooping in and uh, they're starting to buy up the, the rights to these contracts as the uh, the cable companies become unable to pay the big things they used to pay. It's They're starting to, to bit by bit capture some of the sports rights. ...and why young people are turning off the TV. To understand the challenges, it is worth looking at what happened to the music and film industry in the recent decades. Only a few years ago, the only way to legally consume music or movies was by going to a store, not online, but in the real world, to buy strange spherical discs called CDs or DVDs. The big production studios were sending their lawyers to people downloading just one single song or movie from the internet. They were desperately trying to protect their old-fashioned business model. And the Spotify and Netflix, who decided that people might enjoy music or movies online whenever they feel like it. Industry experts dismissed the services as a fad, but there was no turning back. The music and film industries were disrupted. Fast forward to 2021. Streaming services dominate music consumption, and Netflix has outgrown tradition. I fucking love these gra- I'm sorry to interrupt here, but I love these graphics. I really want to get graphics like these for Marketing Monday, at least the YouTube videos. I think it makes it a lot more compelling to watch. Like, I think I can talk about stuff like this, but it looks cool. I, I like these graphics a lot. I think they're just super sick. Traditional Hollywood. I want to find, like, if somebody's really good at something like this, I would love to pay you money to make graphics for Marketing Mondays. To become one of the largest media companies on the planet. Spotify and Netflix were able to disrupt their industries because they understood a simple fact. Give the people what they want, whenever they want it, for a reasonable price, and they will pay for it rather than steal it. Live sports could be facing a similar disruption. Generation Z demand shorter, snackable content and are far less willing to sit through 90 minutes of football just to see a few key moments of action. Is this you guys? This is you? This is Gen Z? <laughs> this is you guys watching my stream right now? You're like, <laughs> you guys eating popcorn? Before the baby boomers get all high and mighty and blame the kids for their short attention spans, the situation is a little bit more complex. Older generations are comfortable consuming sports in the same way as always, through an expensive pay TV package. Younger fans, who are more technologically savvy, realize they can save a lot of money by cutting the cord and using highlights of social media to view key moments. Gen Z have grown up with social media, which provides users with a personalized feed and control over what they consume. Live sports force you to listen to the opinions of a bunch of angry former athletes dispersed between hours of mind-numbing advertising that you can't skip after five seconds. Yeah. Gen Z will tell you time is very the valuable. Is they worse. don't see the value in sitting and watching something for three hours, whether that's a baseball game, the Super Bowl, or the Oscars. Flexibility is important. <laughs> Who's been here for three hours? <laughs> so, some of you gotta be here for three hours, bro. <laughs> and young fans are used to flicking through content on their own terms. The NBA is already working hard to engage the Gen Z fan. Understanding the, the, best the need for flexibility and desire to view the main action, the NBA offers one. The head of marketing at the NBA used to be the head of marketing at Twitch. Um, her name's Kate Javeri. She's fucking amazing. She's one of the best leaders I ever worked for. She's killing it there. And, uh, and they're definitely the most forward thinking. NBA is, is much smarter about this than like every other sport. And that's why I think young people are more likely lead to like the NBA than almost anything else. One subscription for game highlights and another for the last 15 minutes of specific games. 
Sky, one of the largest football broadcasters, has begun to offer fans the ability to purchase access for one single game instead of being stuck in a long term. Talking about contract. only America, though, really. While these yeah, methods may soccer, provide a short term fix, is there a way to increase interest in live sports among younger fans? Before 2017, the fan base of Formula One was shrinking as the cost of cable television rose dramatically. When Liberty Media took over, they started to broadcast Formula One through free-to-air television and began an aggressive campaign to increase appeal among kids. The journey of a young fan looked something like this. Hook them in with a cool promotional video on TikTok or Instagram. Feed their desire to know more with YouTube content and a Netflix documentary series. Get them to watch the race weekends on TV. This strategy appears to be working. In 2020, F1 increased its audience of European kids Bro, by all I think there's tons of people in here that have done this exact route. People are always in my chat saying you should get into F1. F1 is sick. It's like Stans did this, dude. Literally, this is the Stans alt-right pipeline. This guy fucking did the same thing. He fucking he got some random clips. Actually, Rochelle saw TikTok clips, made him watch the Netflix documentary. And now they're fucking all in on F1. They watch every week. They know the fucking... <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, it's actually been very successful. Almost 3 million. This is a 17% year-on-year increase, which puts football's 6% yearly increase into perspective. It is clear that traditional broadcasting is becoming less popular and less lucrative. If sports like football want to prevent a significant drop in their revenues, they might want to follow F1's example. Before fans get too concerned, a major shift in the market does not mean that live sports will cease to exist. After all, the highlights and memes have to come from somewhere. More importantly, the unpredictable magic of two teams going up against each other on a Saturday evening is something that humans, at least the ones behind athletic interest, will always be drawn to. The live sports experience can never be replicated through social media. But the way we consume sports is destined for a major shakeup. Spotify disrupted the music industry. Netflix disrupted the film industry. We might see the next big disruption happening in sports broadcasting. No matter if you want to stream Netflix or sports, you'll probably use the internet, which means A, people will try to get your data, and B, you have... <laughs> and B, if you want to play sports, you got to be healthy, which is why you want to get some meals from Factor Meals. Easy delivered healthy meals to your door use code pog hrock 120 for 120 dollars off link in the panel below um i'm gonna finish my smoothie mm. thank you again factor for sponsoring get smarter saturdays i like that video a lot i'm actually gonna watch this again i want to learn from this to help build marketing mondays because i thought this is like exactly what i want my youtube videos to be like um about this length a lot of graphics Interesting charts. This is really, I like this. I like this a lot. How, how, how well did this do? Wow, not that. <laughs> it's like the same. <laughs> Never mind. I'll just be lazy. <laughs> I, I get like 150K for. <laughs> Bro, what the fuck? Why would I do all that effort for another fucking 50K viewers? I'll just react to MatPat. God damn it. <laughs> Yeah, I, I need more person. I mean, I like, I like having my jokes. I would have some of me in it, but I, I want a lot of these graphics because I think, I think sometimes my marketing Mondays there's a little bit too much of um, single slide no motion and me talking. I want like a little bit of more than that, but we'll work on it. Uh, I thought that was still very good. I wonder if they have what's their best video. I was kind of really interested in that. What's most popular? How Red Bull makes money. Kind of interesting. 5.6 million. In 2019. Eight minutes. Let's watch it. Teen. Red Bull sold one can for almost every person on the planet. But besides selling 7.5 billion cans of a That's very sweet drink, fucking crazy. they also run two Formula One teams, five professional football clubs, and one ice hockey team. Not mentioning events like the Crashed Ice Challenge or the Wings for Life run. The thousands of athletes that Red Bull sponsors and the media production they run. Obviously, Red Bull does much more than selling an energy drink. But is all that just marketing? Don't say just marketing. <laughs> Marketing's cool, bro. 
It's not just in the summer marketing. of 1982, the Austrian businessman Dietrich Mateschitz found himself suffering from jet lag during a business trip to Thailand. He tried a local drink called Krating Deng, which improved his jet lag substantially. Krating Deng can be translated to red gaur, a gaur being a huge bison from Southeast Asia. So it basically means Red Bull. Inspired by the magical qualities of the product, Mateschitz decided to bring the product home in the format of a brand new product category, the energy drink. He pitched his idea several times to Western investors, but got turned down because they didn't see a market for the product outside of Asia. Insane. Mateschitz was well aware that there was no market at the time, so he decided to create one. He was so convinced of his product that he invested half a million himself. He then teamed up with the boss of the Krating Deng manufacturer, who also invested half a million for the other half of the company. Next, Mateschitz adapted the formula and flavor for the European market and successfully launched the yeah, product. Almost every story like this starts with like, we had an idea that made absolute billions, but we got turned down by everybody. It's just, uh, it's, it's interesting how uh, people are very resistant to product in Austria in 1987. Because the drink was initially banned in Germany, Red Bull profited from banned? their reputation as an outlaw brand. <laughs> Many young Germans would cross the border to Austria to buy the banned energy drink, and Red Bull sold over a million cans <laughs> in their first year. From the Austria, bad boy. it quickly spread across Europe, first to Slovakia and Hungary in 1992, and then to Germany and the UK in 94. When they entered the US market three years later, Red Bull was selling over a million cans every day. God damn. Soft drink giants like Coke and Pepsi could benefit from deeper pockets, but they underestimated the strategic intent of Mateschitz and the upcoming brand. He created a new species of corporation that focuses only on the downstream activities of the value chain while outsourcing operations such as production and logistics. That means that Red Bull itself is actually not producing the drink. Production and filling of the cans is completely outsourced, so Red Bull can fully commit its resources to selling the drink. Looking I didn't at know that. The profit I knew that. Margin, I've talked about that before. That pays off. One of Red Bull's secrets to success is that they can charge a much higher price than their competitors. Red Bull makes each can for approximately nine cents. The Perceived value, perhaps? For a can is $3.59. The biggest customers like Walmart and big grocery stores pay between 44 and 48 US dollars per case of 24 cans. That means $1.87 per can, which is more than 20 times the cost of Woo! production. Nice to margin. The market for his product, Mateschitz first focused on the club scene. It's really hard to imagine a student party without several packs of Red Bull on hand, since the company actively made use of student brand managers. Brand managers were popular university students encouraged to promote Red Bull on university campuses and to throw parties at different locations, supplied entirely by Red Bull. Volkswagen Beetles with... It's weird, I never saw any at, um, in my dorm room alone playing League of Legends. <laughs> so how do I know this is true? This never, this never, never, never crossed my path when I was out there being a socialite, um, playing League of Legends alone till 2 a.m. And then till 6 a.m. <laughs> and then till 8 a.m. And then till uh, noon and then falling asleep. <laughs> the larger than life Red Bull cans strapped to their backs showed up at beaches, at colleges, gyms, and even office buildings with free samples. Bartenders quickly learned that this new drink was a money machine. It is likely that you have at least once tasted a Red Bull mixed with vodka or Jäger, since the mixes became two of the most popular Red Bull and vodka was uh, definitely popular. Soon, the beverage was sold at nightclubs and festivals around the world, creating a competitive advantage for the Austrian brand. But this was only the beginning of the Red Bull marketing machine. Through sponsorship and ownership of sports teams, Red Bull continuously engages with the customer in a deeper way than traditional advertising ever could. This allows its customers to feel active and... In I like this. Uh, I don't know if they did this or this is marketing material. I like the idea of the can being in color or everything else is in black and white. You could imagine like a esports star holding a GPU and the GPU is glowing green and it's colored and everything else is black and white. This could be cool. Interesting.
intense by drinking from a can that bears the same logo as a Formula One car, a skateboard, and a record-breaking parachute. Just Instead for like a website, not telling, like a fucking great campaign, but like for a website marketing material. Performing. They or don't a PR do conventional image. marketing or try to look for stories to be associated with. They create their own stories and produce the content with their own media house. That means they hold the rights to all pictures of their events. With social media, this results in viral communication effects that drastically improve the return on marketing. Ooh! The ultimate example for Red Bull's story performing was Felix Baumgartner jumping from space in 2012. The project cost Red Bull an impressive 50 million US dollars, but some experts estimated the global reporting about the event to be worth approximately 6 billion US dollars. So it was probably worth it. Both sponsoring extreme sporting events like this and selling products with an edge enables Red Bull to remain the market leader in its category. In 2019, they sold 7.5 billion cats, which helped create a revenue of over 6 billion US dollars. To reach that much revenue, they spent almost a third on marketing. But despite the huge marketing budget, the revenue growth of Red Bull slowed down since 2012. The company is depending almost completely on one product only, the energy drink. This limits its growth and can eventually become a big risk. Especially with a growing awareness for health and nutrition, the yeah. focus on a product that causes obesity, insomnia, and diabetes. Sometimes you run into macro trends. Like, uh, Investments in sport teams and media production are there. You know, like um, even if you were the best cereal marketer, <laughs> breakfast cereal, people are just eating less cereal. You know, if there's an overall trend against your product, it doesn't matter how good you're doing. Or it's like if you were. <laughs> If you are the best travel agent marketer or DVD marketer, you know what I'm saying? It doesn't matter how well you sell it. You could get market share from your opponents, but it doesn't, your, your whole category is dying. For not only marketing activities, but the attempt to diversify and create additional value chains next to the can business. To implement sport as a business, Red Bull takes advantage of a fully integrated entertainment and media value chain that ranges from media production to team ownerships, broadcasting arrangements and contract management. One example how that strategy can work are Red Bull's football teams. Owning more than one club gives them the opportunity to use synergies, for example when developing talent. A player can potentially own start the clubs? his career in Brazil move to Europe to play in the smaller Austrian league for Salzburg and eventually join Red Bull Leipzig when he is ready to play in the Champions League. Would they straight and up the own the teams? They're not sponsors, they own the teams? It's it, The team is the Red Bull Leipzig. That's, wow, I didn't know that. That's kind of crazy. Interesting. I never even thought of that. It didn't even cross my mind. That's so interesting. I always felt like Logitech could have could have started an esports team. Like Logitech owning a team. But I don't know. It's weird because then you can't sponsor other teams. There's a conflict. The end of his career, he might move to the New York Bulls to spend the last years in the Major League Soccer. The team in New York is also a good example how private equity in sports can generate value for Red Bull. They purchased the team for an estimated $25 million in 2006. According to Forbes, the team is now worth $290 million. Pog. So Red Bull was able to tenfold their investment. And with the US soccer market on the rise, the price for a franchise in New York City will most likely soar in the future. Nevertheless, the overwhelming revenue driver to this day remains beverage sales, representing approximately 97% okay. of the total <laughs> earnings. Red Bull mentions the other activities as ongoing brand investment, which indicates that these are losses, not revenue streams. At least, not yet. Good video. I liked it a lot.